Hi, I'm Brett Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. The federal government announced late last year that it's moving to restrict nicotine levels in vaping products that are manufactured, imported, or packaged for sale in Canada. The new restrictions are intended to lower first-time exposure to high concentrations of nicotine, which of course is an addictive substance, and thereby curtailing the so-called youth vaping epidemic. The Canadian government's proposed restrictions, which are now up for public consultation, are based off of the European Union's Tobacco Products Directive, which sets the maximum concentration of nicotine in vaping products at 20 mg per milliliter. Joining us today to talk about the impact and efficacy of nicotine caps is Lynn Dawkins, Professor of Nicotine and Tobacco Studies at London South Bank University. Professor Dawkins is one of the UK's leading authorities on e-cigarettes, having published numerous papers on the use, acute effects, and delivery of nicotine through vaping products. Professor Dawkins, thanks for joining us again on RegWatch. Thanks for inviting me, Brent. Pleasure to be here. Well, for many Canadian vapors, the proposed new limit would slash by half for some the amount of nicotine consumed when vaping, and by Health Canada's own projections, cause some vapors to return to smoking. Professor Dawkins, when you were last on the show, we was here to discuss the mixed messaging around vaping that was so prevalent in the mainstream media. Are things better or worse now than they were back then? Yeah, um, I was last on the show in October 2017, I believe. Um, so just over three years ago. Um, unfortunately, things haven't really got much better since then. In fact, I think we can safely say things have probably got worse. Um, public misperceptions of e-cigarettes um, have declined. So the number of smokers who correctly believe that e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoking has declined, particularly in the last year. Um, and of course, we've had the, the so-called youth epidemic of vaping in the US. We've had the um, so-called Ivali case, the THC-related lung poisonings. Um, and um, yes, unfortunately, we, we're still in a situation where there's a lot of confusion among the public about e-cigarettes and, and vaping. Professor Dawkins, walk our viewers through your background of research in this area, because, you know, you're a part of that cabal of great UK researchers that, you know, we have on the show and that seem to always be out with the great research and kind of evidence-based, but still, you know, pro at least vaping, you know, for a tool for harm reduction. Is that is that fair? Well, well thank you for saying so. Um, well, I mean, over the last few years, I've, I've been working in a, a few different areas and I'm relating to e-cigarettes. So I've been conducting research that is looking at va vaping behavior associated with using various di different e-cigarette strengths. Um, there's also a line of work where we've been looking at messages on e-cigarette packs and developing new alternative messages to the current nicotine addiction message. And then we've also been doing some work um, around e-cigarettes for smoking cessation, both in the general population of smokers and amongst um deprived groups such as um, homeless smokers. Now, you're kind of known a bit for your myth of vaping lecture. And it goes all the way back to 2013. What are the myths of vaping? Yeah, well, in 2013, there was, you know, very little was known about vaping. So I did that public lecture to really try and help to to inform inform the public. Um, and then in December 2018, I thought we really needed to revisit that because actually the, the misunderstandings have increased um, over that time. I think the main myth of vaping relates to um, safety. So with many people believing that e-cigarettes are just as harmful as um, tobacco smoking, but there are many other myths um, and um, kind of misperceptions around vaping associated with, you know, things like we, we don't know what's in them. They haven't been around for long enough. We don't know the long term effects. Um, everyone's using them. It leads to smoker, smoking in people who wouldn't otherwise have smoked. Let me ask you, this is obviously the big question that has been on everyone's mind, at least on the vapor, the vapor side, where it seems to be that on the opponents to vaping, they're pretty clear about it. They believe there was an epidemic of teen vaping. Is there, was there an epidemic of teen vaping in North America? Well, I mean, there certainly was an increase in vaping amongst teens um, between around 2016, 20, between 2016 and 2018, around that time. Um, 
And amongst some of those people, there was certainly um, daily use and some people certainly became possibly addicted to e-cigarettes, the jewel particularly, and may have found it hard to give up. Um, whether we would say that's an ec epidemic, well, I wouldn't say myself that that constitutes an epidemic. And if you look closely at the figures, we're seeing levels that are very similar to use of other illicit drugs such as marijuana and to alcohol use amongst teenagers as well. And we haven't called that an epidemic. So I personally wouldn't say that there was a vaping epidemic in North America. I'm not, I'm not saying that the increase in vaping shouldn't be a concern. That's certainly something we, we need to closely look at. But of course, more recent figures suggest that um, e-cigarette use amongst teens has started to decline again, as has smoking. So, you know, the real concern would be an increase in smoking here. And we're not seeing that at the moment, as far as, as I understand the, the data. Professor Dawkins, looking at the youth, uh, the National Youth Tobacco Survey for 2020 here, this is out of the U.S., and this just came out just several weeks ago, and it shows that an estimated 1.73 million fewer teens um, actually vaped in uh, 2020. What do you make of that? Because that's a huge reduction, but yet there hasn't been a dampening, a dampening down on kind of the rhetoric and the hype um, around the epidemic. Yeah, and you know, I think the boat has kind of already sailed there, unfortunately, with some kind of knee-jerk regulatory um, reactions. I mean, that obviously is is very good news. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't have a, a very detailed understanding of the regulatory environment in in North America, but my understanding is that some of the advertisements that were perhaps more prominent around Juul in 2015, 2016 were kind of halted. Um, you know, I think Juul was one of the, the major e-cigarettes that perhaps contributed to, to youth use at that time. And, and more has been done there to reduce appeal to young people over the years. Um, so, you know, that, that may have contributed to, to the decline and maybe also just you know, it, a passing fad, a phase, the novelty is kind of worn off as well. Um, you know, it's many reasons, but uh, we're not, we haven't seen that at all in the UK. We haven't seen a huge surge in um, vaping uptake amongst young people. And there may be many reasons for that. It, it could be because the nicotine concentrations are lower, um, perhaps more likely because of um, restrictions on advertising and marketing. So we we don't allow that kind of marketing and advertising of e-cigarettes in the UK. When we're looking at any use, we're certainly not capturing problematic use. What we're capturing is experimentation. And of course, that's fine. Young people do experiment with, with all kinds of products. Um, if there is more regular prolonged use, um, then that may become a problem. But I don't think we're seeing really huge levels there that we would call an epidemic. Although for certain individuals, it may be problematic. For certain young people who feel that, you know, they, they have to use it every day, perhaps they can't afford to do so, and it may be a problem for them. You know, um, that's an individual issue, not, not what I would call an epidemic. What's the most disturbing thing in your mind uh, with regards to how other researchers, regulators, and the media are approaching this entire issue? For a product that was designed to help smokers to quit, it seems that the focus has shifted away from that. And the focus has become more about preventing uptake amongst young people. You would design a product differently to help smokers quit than you would if you're focusing on reducing uptake among young people or non-smokers. So I think that if you're working with young people and you're seeing young people using a new product unnecessarily, it's kind of understandable that that would be your concern. If you're not working with smokers and seeing the death and the disease and the difficulties that smokers are having quitting, difficulties they're having breathing from you know years and years of smoking. Um, so it, it, you know, it's understandable that 
people are not so much focused on creating a product to help smokers quit, but that really is the, the public health problem. You know, smoking is still killing half of all regular long-term users. When we first started covering this topic, and I'm sure in our piece that we had you on back in 2017, there's always, at least then, discussion around the end game, uh, you know, for smoking. The idea is to eradicate smoking and find these ways to move, you know, to try to save a billion lives that, you know, would die in this century. That seems to be lost. Yes, I mean, the ambition is still there, but it doesn't look like we are going to succeed with, with that target um, unless we can promote reduced risk products such as e-cigarettes, in, in my opinion. Um, we know that the products that we currently have available are, you know, are, are fairly effective, but really nicotine, nicotine replacement therapy products we're seeing very low levels of, of long-term success. So we, we clearly need to do more, especially for those smokers who have tried to quit so many times and find it so difficult to quit. If we can you know, invest in products such as e-cigarettes that we can make more attractive, more effective um, for smokers, then you know, that is one way that we could potentially you know, reach this end game and reduce smoking to less than 5%. Would it be accurate to say that vaping is shown safe? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say, we could say vaping is absolutely safe. Um, we certainly, um, well, research that has certainly shown that there are potentially harmful chemicals in, in the aerosol. Um, but, you know, compared to tobacco smoke, these levels are far, far lower. Um, now, that message obviously isn't getting through. Um, it's just, you know, formaldehyde found in, in vapour, potential harmful chemicals found in vapour. But the critical comparison is, you know, how much? I mean, we often hear the dose makes the poison, which, which you know, it's absolutely true. So um, messages need to be very clear around, um, yes, vaping is not absolutely safe and no one is um, saying it's, I've never heard anyone saying it's absolutely safe, in fact. Um, and we shouldn't be encouraging people who are not smokers to, to use vaping products. But the critical comparison is cigarette smoking, which is so very, very harmful. Vaping, on the other hand, is offering, I think Public Health England got it about right when they said vaping is 90, around 95% less harmful. And that's supported by um, switching studies, biomarker studies, exposure studies, um, which show, you know, there is about 5% of the risk in, in vaping products. Let's take a quick listen to your appearance back in 2017 with regards to some gentle advice you had for public health and regulators regarding the messaging around vaping. Considering the preponderance of news stories biased towards the potential health risks of e-cigarettes, it's not hard then to understand why public perception has so dramatically turned against vaping. In the briefing, the BPS recommends promoting e-cigarettes for smoking cessation, improving education about the relative risk of vaping versus smoking, allowing unrestricted advertising of factual information, and reducing the cost, taxation, and regulations around vaping. Dr. Dawkins, thanks for joining us on RegWatch. Based on your report, it's pretty clear the BPS is squarely behind promoting e-cigarettes as a safer alternative to smoking. The recommendations from the BPS were, were all drawing on the evidence that they're safer, the evidence that they are helpful for quitting smoking, and on those principles of behavior change. So this was about increasing um, capabilities and increasing motivation. And one way we can increase motivation to use is through advertising and through public messaging. But that is presenting factual information. But of course, advertising has to be subject to the usual standards and checks for any advertising for, for consumer products. So for example, ensuring that they're not promoted to children, um, that they're decent, but Aside from that, if the information is evidence-based and accurate, it's going to increase the attractiveness of the product for smokers and therefore increase motivation to use. And that's what this briefing was all about. It was about increasing capabilities, opportunities and motivation to switch to e-cigarettes and to stay switched. 
So Professor Dawkins, you said increase the attractiveness for smokers and increase the motivation to use. That's what you would like to see in the messaging. Has that happened? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> um, no. Um, although, um, you know, there, there are differences um, across the world, differences um, from country to country. Um, and there are some movements perhaps in the UK towards this. I mean, we are we have exited the EU now. The, the review of the TPD is due. And in 2018, the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee um, undertook an inquiry into e-cigarettes. And their recommendations were partly around the anomalies of the TPD, which were things around the cap on nicotine concentrations in e-liquid, the size of the tanks, um, prohibitions on making reduced risk claims of switching to e-cigarettes. Um, and these were um, accepted by the UK Department of Health and Social Care, who expressed a commitment to explore these. So there are some signs there that the, there may be some movements with the UK exit from the EU that we may be able to review some of these things. And if we can perhaps remove the cap on nicotine concentrations or we can change the messages on e-cigarette packs. Those are the kinds of things we can start doing to increase effectiveness of the product for those smokers who haven't tried e-cigarettes or have not found them satisfying en enough um, and encourage people to perhaps try them. There's 32% of smokers in Great Britain who haven't tried e-cigarettes at all. Um, you know, one of the things may be, you know, scary nicotine addiction messages on packs and indeed Many smokers cite um, worry about transferring their nicotine addiction as, as a reason not to use e-cigarettes. So, so I think in the UK there is perhaps still some hope and some, some signs that things may change. Um, elsewhere in the world, I'm, I'm not sure that we're seeing any signs of making e-cigarettes more attractive um, to users and, and to encourage motivation to use. Um, and I think with the possible restrictions on nicotine levels in Canada, you know, that's going to be a real disincentive. It, it's not going to help smokers find a product that is satisfying enough for them to enable them to make that switch from smoking. So what's your, you know, what's your professional opinion on the proposed regulations in Canada to cap the nicotine strike, considering that, as I mentioned in our lead, they're pretty much similar and based off of the TPD in the EU. So you've got some experience in understanding what that impact is. And what do you foresee? Yeah. What do you foresee in terms of the impact here in Canada if it was to go ahead? Well, I mean, people adapt the way they vape. Um, it, it, there hasn't been a massive outrage and there are still a few people who are vaping concentrations higher than 20 milligrams per milliliter, but you know, they really are in the minority there. And at the same time, e-cigarettes e have evolved um, with higher power devices to allow people to get that same nicotine hit and also reduce their nicotine concentration in e-liquids. Um, but on the other hand, not everyone is um, an expert with using e-cigarettes. Not everyone can use um, high functioning variable voltage devices and get the nicotine they need and may want to use smaller, more subtle devices with a lower power battery where they do need those higher concentrations um, of nicotine. I mean, we, so we haven't seen a huge problem, but um, I don't I don't personally endorse uh, a nicotine restriction at 20 milligrams per milliliter. It's absolutely not evidence-based. It was introduced in the very early days before there, there had been hardly any e-cigarette research. At the time, this TPD regulation was being formed in the EU. And since then, in fact, my research has shown actually that there may be more harms actually associated with reducing your nicotine concentration, all other things being equal. Speaking of your research then, Professor Dawkins, we've got a slide here. This is from a piece of research that was published in 2018 that you did, Nicotine Absorption, 
from e-cigarettes over 12 months, and here's the pull quote, experienced vapors reduce the concentration of nicotine in their e-liquid over time, but maintain their nicotine intake, possibly via more intensive puffing. Findings suggest there may be little benefit in reducing nicotine e-liquid concentration since this appears to result in higher e-liquid consumption, which may incur both a financial and health cost. What does that mean? That, that, I mean, that um, quote is rather speculative, but in fact, we have demonstrated that empirically in the lab and in vapors outside the lab. So we've had a program of research looking at this. Um, we know that smokers will adjust the way they smoke in order to maintain a constant kind of blood nicotine level that is um, kind of desirable for them. And we were the first research group to show that this is the case in vapors as well. So both in the lab and outside of the lab, when we give vapors different nicotine concentrations to use in the same e-cigarette over a few weeks, we see that people will adjust the way they vape. So when they switch from a higher to a lower nicotine concentration, it will increase the number of puffs they take, they'll increase their puff duration and gain the same kind of blood nicotine levels. So as has been the case, of, we've known this for years, that smokers were attempt to self-titrate by just in the way they puff, we've also demonstrated that that is the case with um, e-cigarette users as well. Um, now, the problem with that is, is that um, when we mimic those different puffing patterns associated with using a lower and a higher nicotine concentration in the lab, we find that actually there's an increase in exposure to potentially harmful chemicals, acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, for example, in the vapor, because people are just vaping more. So kind of counterintuitively, actually reducing nicotine intake just means more vaping and more exposure to any potentially harmful compounds that are in, in the vapor. Now, these are at very low levels. I'm not saying this is anything like tobacco smoking, but we want vaping to be as safe as it, as it possibly can be. So any kind of increase in exposure is, is unnecessary when people can take more nicotine and vape less. Professor Dawkins, you came out with a piece of research that you just referenced. It was 2020, daily exposure to formaldehyde, the potential health risk associated with the use of high and low nicotine e-liquid concentrations. Now, for many vapors, when they hear formaldehyde, they just recoil because that is the original smear pretty much that was used incessantly. And you can still hear it today when people talk about the risks of vaping. How were you able to square that with regards to coming out with this research, you know, looking for that chemical in vaping? We showed in our research that when people use a lower nicotine concentration, they vape more, they vape more intensively and formaldehyde is increased. But to, uh, to, is that increase in formaldehyde is no way near as high as the levels of formaldehyde that people are exposed to from tobacco smoking. And we make that very clear in, in the paper itself. So the increase from switching to a high nicotine concentration to a low concentration is apparent. Um, whether that is at um, a very, whether that is at a level to pose a very strong health risk is unclear but we do know it's still far lower than the levels that you're ex exposed to from tobacco smoking. But as I said, you know, it's an unnecessary risk. We, we don't want, there's no need to increase formaldehyde by vaping more if you can get the nicotine fix you need by just having a higher concentration in, in the e-liquid. So, Professor Dawkins, one of the major criticisms tobacco control had, you know, back in the day when the tobacco industry rolled out so-called light cigarettes, was that smokers would be compelled to draw or inhale on these products harder in order to get their desired dose of nicotine, thus increasing the amount of deadly chemicals and tar inhaled. So is there not a way to go back to tobacco control and say, you know, your push uh, on lowering nicotine levels, here's our research that says that vapors will draw on them harder and think back, you know, to your complaints, of, you know, towards tobacco industry back in the day, you know, should this should be common sense that you don't want the user to be inhaling harder to get their dose of nicotine. Absolutely. Um, and it seems a hard message to get through. Um, we, we did a press release on this particular um, research outcome. It wasn't really picked up 
by the press. I don't know if it's a difficult message to put across to the media. Um, I did raise it with the science and technology, um, the House of Commons Science and Technology inquiry into e-cigarettes, and um, they they were fully on board with it. And one of the recommendations to the UK government was to revisit this nicotine limit on e-cigarettes. I guess the problem with it is that there's so much of a worry about higher nicotine concentrations, um, addicting a new generation of users, whether that is you know founded or ill-founded, that is a real concern. Um, so I, I guess it's easier to just stick with a limit on on the nicotine concentrations. How addictive is nicotine? How dangerous is nicotine? Well, nicotine is clearly addictive. Um, I mean, it depends on the manner in which it's delivered and the speed in which the nicotine is delivered. And of course, cigarette smoking is the most effective way of getting nicotine to the brain. You take a puff, it reaches the brain within 20 seconds. And that's known to be you know, the most addictive way of, of taking um, nicotine through smoking. Eat, um, things like nicotine patch, on the other hand, obviously very slow absorption. Um, and we don't tend to see people being addicted to the nicotine patch. So, you know, clearly nicotine is addictive, but we must remember that the manner in which it's delivered and the speed in which it's delivered is is of critical importance when it when it comes to um, nicotine addiction. In terms of harms, well, we know that nicotine is a mild stimulant, um, probably not recommended for people with a heart condition, but other than that, really, it, it's a fairly safe drug. If you know, you know, that's the basis for nicotine replacement therapy. You are de- giving people the nicotine that they need, that they're addicted to, but in a cleaner way without the harmful effects of, of tobacco smoking. Professor Dawkins, now when I was younger, my parents, you know, adults, I heard it in the media, I heard it, you know, everywhere, was that don't smoke, Johnny, as it will stunt your growth. You know, if you smoke, your growth will be stunted. And now that sounds awfully similar to the current warning that nicotine harms developing brains. Is, is it the same? I mean, is there real evidence? Does nicotine actually harm developing brains or is it another old wives tale designed to scare kids? You know, actually, it's really hard to to study this. Um, there is some evidence from rodents that nicotine can cause harm to to the brain. But in in um, humans, we I don't think at the moment we have enough evidence to make that conclusion. There are certainly associations between smoking and cognitive performance, but the problem is disentangling those effects and um, disentangling those from other things associated with um, socioeconomic status and poor living conditions and um, likelihood of smoking, depending on other factors. So um, it's possible, but... I personally don't think there is enough evidence to make a strong conclusion that nicotine is particularly harmful to the developing brain. We know that is a period of plasticity, a period of, you know, of development of the brain. So um, it, it's perfectly plausible. Um, if there are harms, it, it is has been quite hard to pinpoint them in in humans. With regard to a nicotine cap. Um, is there any evaluation on whether it quote unquote worked in the EU and the UK? When you say did it work, it, it's what are we trying to protect here? Does it work for helping people to stop smoking? Does it work to deter youth uptake? It didn't seem to pose any major problems. Um, some people were still able to get higher concentrations. Other people just switch to lower concentrations and use higher powered devices. Um, So I don't think it was a major problem, but I think that we could go so much further with helping smokers to quit if we did allow higher concentrations. And I go back to this point about so many smokers who have tried e-cigarettes and just abandoned them, not found them satisfying enough. They didn't reduce their cravings. It wasn't like smoking. Now, if a higher nicotine concentration were permitted, especially in smaller, simpler, low-powered devices, I think we could see 
much more of a benefit there in terms of helping smokers to switch. So whilst we haven't seen any major problems, I think there is, you know, there's a potential there. And we would be missing a trick by keeping this cap on nicotine concentrations. So it sounds to me like there's a conflict between what smokers need in terms of having devices that are as close to the experience, whether it's even in form factor, flavor, you know, nicotine intake and so forth. There's a there's a conflict between that and then attracting youth to using those products. And so it seems to me that regulators and public health have just kind of thrown up their hands and said, look, we just we have to protect the kids. And that's at the expense of better devices, better nicotine for adults. Yeah, I think that's perfectly right, Brent. Yeah, you've got a point. Um, but there are other things we can do to stop youth uptake. Restrictions on advertising, allowing e-cigarette manufacturers to make accurate um, claims about their products, to make reduced risk claims, to target their products at smokers, to, you know, to advertise these as smoking cessation devices or um, reduced risk alternative to smoke to sp for smokers, those kind of things would not be so appealing for younger people. So there are other things I think we can do rather than just saying, right, we're going to restrict the nicotine and that should you know, solve the, the youth uptake problem. One of the things here in Canada that's often discussed is that let's keep the higher concentrations of nicotine where adults shop, where it's adults only. So in the specialty vape shops and so forth. So maybe that's a compromise. What do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, those. I think those kind of um, regulations are, are perfectly sensible and it would allow us to give the smokers the attractive, effective products that they need to help them stop smoking, but also to reduce any unnecessary use amongst young non-smokers. Could Nick Caps do more harm than good? Yes, I think so. I mean, our, our research has certainly shown that if you switch from a, um, a higher strength to a lower strength, that you puff more, and more intensive puffing is associated with higher levels of exposure to potentially harmful compounds to carcinogenic compounds. Um, so absolutely, I think it could do more harm than good for smokers. And not just that, but it also will have the effect of not being effective enough for those highly dependent smokers who have tried lots of other methods of quitting and haven't found a product satisfying enough to enable them to quit smoking completely. They may need these higher nicotine levels in order to successfully transition from smoking. So not allowing smokers to have that access, those more heavily dependent smokers to have access to the, to the higher nicotine concentrations may actually um, make it more difficult for them to quit. So last question then with regards to the nicotine cap, uh, potential nicotine cap in Canada, do you have any advice for Health Canada with regards to this consultation? Well, I mean, I, I mean, my advice would be to not just jump in and do this just because the EU have done it. Because that decision was made very, very early in, in vaping history. It, it wasn't evidence-based. I think if there's going to be a cap, then you could certainly go higher than 20 milligram per milliliter. It's something that needs to be very carefully looked at. Um, work like my own on compensatory puffing and the effects there need to be carefully balanced against any research that has shown higher nicotine concentrations do mean more youth addiction. And I am not aware of any research that has shown that. Um, but it is, it's, it's, a very, it's a very delicate balance and I think this is something that um, they should widely consult on before before making a decision. But I would say perhaps 20 is a little bit too low, given the number of smokers who are still not finding e-cigarettes um, satisfying enough.